All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. In problem one, we're given the angle theta to be negative three pi over four, and we're going to find exact values for the secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent of theta. So here's our standard unit circle along with the x-axis. Now the angle is negative three pi over four, which means starting from going right, the positive x-axis, we're going to rotate clockwise three pi over four and end up somewhere around here. The acute angle formed with the x-axis is this missing bit of pi over four. There's our reference angle. So looking up the reference angle pi over four, we'll find an x and y coordinate on the unit circle of root two over two, but we realize we are in the third quadrant. We're going to make them both negative. So the point on the unit circle corresponding to our angle of negative three pi over four is minus root two over two, minus root two over two. The secant of the angle is one over the x coordinate. So looking at our x coordinate and reciprocating, we're just gonna end up with negative root two. The cosecant is the reciprocal of the y coordinate, which is the same as the x coordinate for this angle. So we get minus root two again. Since the x and y coordinates are the same, the tangent, which is the ratio of y to x will be one. And the cotangent is the reciprocal of that, which will also be one. In problem two, we're given an angle theta of seven pi over six. We're gonna find exact values for the secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent of the angle. Here's our unit circle with the x-axis drawn. The angle seven pi over six is just a little bit larger than pi. In fact, it's pi over six larger than pi. So here is our reference angle. This gives us an x coordinate of root three over two and a y coordinate of one half, but we're in the third quadrant, so we make them both negative. The secant of theta is one over the x coordinate of the corresponding point on the unit circle. So referring to our x coordinate of negative root three over two and reciprocating, we get negative two over root three. I for one am fine leaving radicals in the denominator. If your instructor does not go for such shenanigans, then you'll have to simplify this a little further. The cosecant of the angle is one over the y coordinate, which is just going to be negative two in this case. The tangent of theta is the ratio of y over x. Our negatives and our quotients of two are gonna cancel out. We have one over root three. Again, you might have to simplify further. And the cotangent of theta is x divided by y, which resolves to simply being root three. In problem three, theta is given to be five pi over three. We're going to find exact values for the sine, cosine, tangent, and secant of the angle. Here is our unit circle with the x-axis. Now five pi over three is actually reasonably close to two pi. In fact, it's pi over three away. This is our reference angle, the acute angle formed with the x-axis. Looking up an angle of pi over three on our sort of standard reference chart, we get an x-coordinate of one half and a y-coordinate of root three over two, but since we're in the fourth quadrant, we're gonna make our y-coordinate negative for this point. The sine of the angle is the y coordinate, which is simply minus root three over two. The cosine of the angle is the x coordinate of this corresponding point, which is exactly one half. The tangent of the angle is the ratio of y over x, which resolves to negative root three. And the secant is one over the x coordinate, which is simply two. In problem four, we're not given the angle theta, but we are told that the sine of theta is three sevenths and that it is an angle in quadrant two, and we're going to find the cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent of this angle. Here is our standard unit circle with the x-axis drawn. Now we're given that the sine of theta is three sevenths, which means it has a y coordinate corresponding to that angle of three sevenths, but it's in quadrant two. So of the two intersections with this line, y equals three over seven, which one is the angle in quadrant two? It's this one here. So there is our angle theta. Now the circle obeys the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. We were given the y coordinate to be three over seven, the square of which is nine over 49. This allows us to solve that x is either plus or minus two times the square root of 10 divided by seven but we're in quadrant two, which means the x-coordinate is negative. X is negative two root 10 divided by seven. Now the cosine of theta is the x-coordinate, which we've just found. The tangent of theta is the ratio of y to x. And remember we were given that y is equal to positive three sevenths. Three sevenths divided by negative two root 10 over seven resolves down to negative three over two root 10. The secant of theta is one over the x-coordinate, so we reciprocate it. The cosecant of theta is the reciprocal of the y coordinate. And since we were given that the sine of theta was 3 sevenths, the y coordinate is 3 sevenths, its reciprocal is 7 thirds. And the cotangent is the ratio of x to y, which is negative two root 10 over three. In problem five, the tangent of theta is 12 over five and theta is in between zero and pi over two. 
we're going to find exact values for the sine, cosine, and secant of theta. Here's our unit circle with x-axis. Now, we weren't given the angle theta, but we were told that its tangent is 12 over 5. In other words, whatever point on the circle it corresponds to, the ratio of y to x is 12 over 5, meaning y is 12 over 5 times x. Now, this is the equation of a line that I can plot. It has intercept 0, 0 and slope 12 over 5, which is a little bit bigger than 2. So this is a plausibly good drawing. Notice that this line, however, corresponds to two points on the circle. So which one is our actual angle theta? It's the one between 0 and pi over 2 in the first quadrant here. The circle obeys the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now we do not know x and we do not know y, but we know that y is equal to 12 over 5 times x, so we substitute that in for y. Squaring this gives us a denominator of 25, which I go ahead and give to every term. We can now solve for x squared to be 25 over 169, meaning x is plus or minus 5 over 13. But because we know that theta is in the first quadrant, x must be positive. So x is 5 over 13. What about y? We already know it to be 12 over 5 times x, meaning y must be 12 over 13. Now the sine of the angle is the y coordinate of the corresponding point, which we found to be 12 over 13. The cosine of theta is the x coordinate, which we have found to be 5 over 13. And the secant of theta is 1 over the x coordinate, so we simply reciprocate the cosine and get 13 over 5. In problem 6, we're given that the point 60, negative 11 is on the terminal side of the angle theta, and we're going to find exact values for all six standard trigonometric functions of theta. Here's our standard unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, with coordinate axes thrown in for good measure. The point 60 minus 11 is way outside the circle with a very large positive x and negative y value. There it is in quadrant 4. But it does lie on some circle centered at the origin. In other words, some circle x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where I don't yet know the value of r. But there's our angle theta. It points to the point 60, negative 11 which means that the angle theta does correspond to some point on the standard unit circle. Now that circle has radius 1 in contrast to our larger circle of radius r. However, the angle theta now points to something on the standard unit circle, which means the coordinates of that point of intersection are by definition cosine theta comma sine theta. And our larger circle is similar, and I mean that geometrically. Everything has merely been scaled by a factor of r. So on the unit circle, we have point cosine theta comma sine theta. So on the larger circle, we have the point r times cosine theta, r times sine theta. Now we know that we're on the circle x squared plus y squared equals r squared, x equals 60 and y equals negative 11. This allows us to solve for r. It is 61. I don't need to consider the negative solution. The radii of our circle are always positive. So negative 11, the y coordinate, we already knew was going to be r times the sine of theta, but we've solved that r is 61. That allows us to solve that the sine of theta is negative 11 over 61. Similarly, we knew that 60 is r cosine theta, r is 61. This allows us to solve for the cosine theta, 60 over 61. Now that we know the sine and cosine of the angle, everything else is fairly quick. The tangent of theta is the sine divided by the cosine, which is negative 11 over 60. The cosecant is 1 over the sine, so we merely reciprocate sine of theta. The secant is 1 over cosine, so we reciprocate the cosine of theta. And the cotangent is cosine divided by sine, so we reciprocate the tangent. In problem 7, we're going to give exact answers as simplified fractions. First, if sine x is 3 fifths, then what is cosecant x? This is pretty quick. Cosecant x is the reciprocal of sine. So if the sine of x is 3 fifths, then the cosecant is 5 thirds. Similarly, the secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So if cos x equals 2 thirds, then secant x equals 3 halves. And finally, the cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So if tangent of x equals 7, then cotangent of x is simply 1 over 7. Next up, we're going to simplify the expression cosecant squared t divided by cosecant squared t minus 1 to an expression with only one trigonometric function and no fractions remaining. Now before we get to that, let's remember the standard Pythagorean identity, cos squared t plus sine squared t is always equal to 1. If I divide both sides by sine squared t and distribute on the left, we end up with the cotangent squared of t plus 1 is equal to the cosecant squared of t, or the cotangent squared of t is cosecant squared t minus 1, that's exactly our denominator. So in our original expression, cosecant squared t over cosecant squared t minus 1, we replace that denominator with cotangent squared t. Now cosecant squared in the numerator is 1 over sine squared, and cotangent squared in the denominator is cos squared over sine squared. 
we have a shared denominator of sine squared, which we can cancel out, leaving behind just 1 over cos squared t, aka secant squared of t. We should be a little careful. We have various quotients floating around, and we want to make sure we haven't accidentally excluded some values of t. So the only thing that ever appears in a denominator, we see a sine squared, so sine of t shouldn't be equal to zero. But for those values of t, the original is not defined. The original expression has a cosecant or a one over sine. So if sine t were ever zero, then the original expression would not exist anyway. Note, however, we also can't have the cosine of t equal to zero because we are at some stage dividing by cotangent. And if the cosine of t was zero, then the cotangent would be zero, that would be forbidden. But, and this is a little trickier to see, wherever the cosine of t is zero, the sine of t is plus or minus one, which would make the cosecant squared equal to one. So those values of t were already implicitly excluded because in our original expression, we would end up with a denominator of zero. So for any t for which both of the cosecant exists and cosecant squared is not equal to one, those are the only t's that are valid for the original expression. For those values of t, the original will in fact be equal to secant squared of t. In problem nine, we're gonna simplify cosecant t times sine of t to a single trigonometric function or constant. Well, the cosecant of t is one over sine t, so one over sine t times sine t is just equal to one. There's not a whole lot to do here. We do wanna be a little careful. If sine of t is equal to zero, then cosecant t doesn't even exist. So I wouldn't want to say that cosecant t times sine t equals one when t is equal to zero or any other value for which the sine of t is zero but implicitly we're not considering those values of t because we wrote down cosecant t to begin with. In problem 10, we're going to simplify the tangent of t divided by the secant of t to a single trigonometric function or constant. My default in problems like this is usually to replace everything in terms of sines and cosines. It gives us fewer moving parts. So the tangent is sine t over cos t and secant is one over cos t. We have a shared denominator of cosine, which we cancel out, leaving behind sine t over one. However, we can't do this if the cosine of t is equal to zero, because then our first step would involve division by zero. But if the cosine of t were zero, the secant wouldn't exist to begin with in our original expression. Also, we don't want our original expression to have a denominator of zero, but zero isn't in the range of the secant function anyway, so that's not a problem either. In problem 11, we're going to simplify the secant of t minus cosine of t all divided by the tangent of t to a single trigonometric function or constant. Now we've got secants and tangents floating around. I like to replace those in terms of sines and cosines. Secant t is one divided by cosine t and tangent of t is sine t over cos t. Now we have fractions within fractions, but we have a shared denominator of cosine. So I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator of our entire expression by cosine t. This results in one minus cosine squared t divided by sine of t. Now that numerator one minus cosine squared t should be recognizable as very similar to the standard Pythagorean identity, sine squared t plus cos squared t equals one. In other words, one minus cos squared t is sine squared t. I can now cancel out a factor of sine t. So overall, we simply have the sine of t. However, in the second and third to last lines, notice that we have a sine of t down in the denominator. That can't happen. So we wanna make sure the sine of t isn't zero. But if the sine of t were zero, the original expression wouldn't be defined either because if sine t is zero, then tangent is zero. We also, however, cannot have the cosine of t equal to zero because in the first line of our work, we have quotients of cosine t, but if the cosine of t were zero, the original secant expression wouldn't exist. For problem 12, we'll simplify one plus the secant of t divided by one plus cosine of t to a single trigonometric function or constant. As always, I like to replace functions in terms of sines and cosines, so I replace that secant with one over cosine. These two terms in the numerator, I'm gonna give a common denominator of cosine t and add them together. So that simplifies as cos t plus one over cos t, all divided by one plus cos t. Now we can factor a one plus cos t out of that numerator expression, but we can also factor it out of our original denominator. So we can get one plus cos t over one plus cos t times one over cosine t. The one plus cos t over one plus cos t's cancel out and one over cosine t is simply secant of t. Now let's check if we had any sort of forbidden steps. Now we can't have cosine of t equal to zero because it does appear as a denominator somewhere, but we also can't have cosine t equal to negative one because one plus cosine t appears as a denominator. However, in the original expression, if cos t were zero, then the secant t wouldn't exist. And if cosine t were minus one, then the overall denominator would be zero. So these were already implicitly forbidden.
Problem 13, we will simplify the expression in terms of sine and cosine. We begin with 1 plus the cosine of y, all divided by 1 plus the secant of y. Well, we want to just have sines and cosines, so we replace secant y with 1 over cosine y, and we're done, because all we have are sines and cosines, but I'm pretty sure we're expected to simplify this further. So let's look at that denominator, 1 plus 1 over cosine y. I'm going to give them a common denominator of cosine y. Going fairly quickly through the algebra of this, that numerator of 1 plus cos y I'm just going to bring out. The denominator becomes cos y plus 1 over cos y, but it's the denominator of a fraction, so I bring it up top by reciprocating. I can now cancel out the 1 plus cos y over 1 plus cos y, leaving behind just cosine of y. Now, this isn't valid in if any denominator ever shows up to be 0, so I can't have the cosine of y being 0, but in the original expression that was already forbidden because we have a secant showing up. We also can't have cos y equal minus 1 because we do have a denominator at some point of 1 plus cosine of y. But observe, if cosine is equal to minus 1, then secant is minus 1, and then our original denominator would be 0 anyway, so those values would also be forbidden. In problem 14, we're going to simplify in terms of sine and cosine. Tan squared x minus secant squared x. Well, tangent is sine over cosine, and secant is 1 over cosine, and here we are, we're done. Everything is in terms of sines and cosines, and again, I'm pretty sure we're expected to simplify this. We already have a common denominator of cos squared, so we just get sine squared x minus 1, which looks a lot like a Pythagorean identity. In fact, it's equal to cos squared. We now have cos squared x over cos squared x. That's just 1, but now let's check. The two expressions can only be equal if they both exist. Did we ever divide by anything? Yes, we divided by cosine, but if cosine x were ever equal to zero, those values of x were already forbidden in the original expression because we were dividing by cosine in both the tangent and secant terms. For problem 15, let's complete each of the following. If the tangent of x is 3.5, then what's the tangent of minus x? If the sine of x is 0 0.1, what's the sine of minus x? If cosine of x is 0 0.3, then what's the cosine of minus x? And if tangent of x is 2.5, then what's the tangent of x plus pi? Well, the thing to remember is that sine and tangent are both odd functions, whereas cosine is an even function. So the tangent of minus x is minus tangent of x. We know tan of x is 3.5, so this results in minus 3.5. Sine is also odd, so we can factor that minus out and get minus 0 0.1. Cosine is even, so simply ignore the minus inside and just get a 0 0.3. Now, if the tangent of x is 2.5, what's the tangent of x plus pi? Sine and cosine have period 2 pi, but tangent actually has a period of pi. So the tangent of x plus pi is the same thing as the tangent of x, which we were given to be 2.5. Problem 16, we want to simplify to an expression involving a single trig function and no fractions. We have the cosine of minus x over the tangent of minus x plus the sine of minus x. We don't actually have to simplify these minus x's to anything, but they offend my sensibilities, so I'm going to remember that sine and tangent are odd, whereas cosine is even. So the cosine of minus x I can replace with cos x, whereas for both tangent of minus x and sine of minus x, I can factor that minus sine out. So now what we have, replacing tangent with sine over cosine, is a fairly unwieldy expression, negative cos x divided by sine x over cos x, all of that minus sine x. If I then take this fraction sine over cosine, which is in the denominator, and reciprocate it to bring it up to the numerator, we have negative cos squared x over sine x minus sine x. I want to give those a common denominator, so I do. I can now combine them into a single fraction and factor out that negative 1. So we have negative cos squared x plus sine squared x divided by sine x. Of course, cos squared x plus sine squared x is simply 1, so we have negative 1 over sine x, or negative cosecant x. We now have a single trig function and no fractions remaining. Unless, of course, cosine x is 0 or sine x equals 0, because both of these terms showed up as denominators. However, in the original expression, since we have a tangent of x, we can't have cosine of x equal to 0, but tangent of x is in the denominator, so tangent can't be 0. In other words, sine x can't be 0. So these were already forbidden, and we don't need to account for them.